Our next guest is called both a conservative and a liberal, a reactionary and a thoughtful man. It just depends on who you ask. He now argues that the current anti-racism ideology is a new religion of the left. The renowned linguist John McWhorter is in uh, interesting space in his new book, Woke Racism. He lashes out at what he calls the third wave anti-racism, which positions racism to be the totality of black American experience. And he also calls out the black elect names such as Ibram Kendi, ta Coates, Nicole Hannah-Jones. These are the folk who are promoting these ideas that he argues infantilize black people. I always find John to be provocative and thoughtful and interesting and civil, and that's why I love talking to him, and that's why I'm glad to have him on Black News tonight right now. Uh, again, John McWhorter, the author of Woke Racism. He's also, by the way, uh, has a day job. He's an associate professor of English and comparative literature at Columbia University. John, good to see you as always. Um, before asking why you see anti-racism as a new religion uh, of, of the left, I first would like for you to define what you mean when you say anti-racism ideology. Well, what I mean is anti-racism in this modern guise. I don't mean civil rights activism. I don't mean what we thought of as anti-racism if we use that word in, say, 2015. I mean this new idea that you have to think of yourself, if you're white, as complicit and therefore guilty within an abstract system that you need to think of whiteness as a state of fragility because nobody wants to admit just how deeply racist they are. And also where we see whole institutions turned upside down, where there's a focus on battling power differentials as the main meal rather than one of about seven or eight. So we're talking about what many people think of as quote unquote crazy wokeness. And I don't think it's crazy. I'm not into calling people names, but it's this thing that's confusing a lot of people, including black people. And I think that we need to question some of its basic underpinnings. One of the things you do in the book uh, is you lay out who your audience is, you, you know, because the default assumption is that you are writing this book in a sort of cynical way to, you know, get book sales from conservatives who already agree with you or white people who uh, would trust this argument from a black voice. Uh, in the book, you start to you get at this, but help us understand who is the audience for this for this book, and why did you write it? Well, you know, I think I should say one thing: the idea that someone like me would sit and think, "I'm going to write a book for white people who want to be absolved of their racism because they'll give me a lot of money." What kind of human being would that be? That has nothing to do with anything I have ever thought or been. This is a book for Black America. This is a book for white people who are concerned about racism and want to be the best people they can be, but are being, I think, distracted by this notion that virtue signaling and policing language and examining your complicity is the same thing as helping black people who need help out in the real world. I wrote this book because I think that we have a detour in the civil rights revolution. I'm not questioning that the civil rights revolution was good. I am not a man of the right. I know a lot of people think that I'm a, a conservative Republican. I get why they think that, but I'm not. I've never voted Republican in my life. I want us to get back to helping black people who need help. And this new version of anti-racism strikes me as being more about talking about things and showing each other that we're sophisticated. I don't think that's good enough. John, though, I think part of the challenge for the book is that the, for me, is that the, some of the arguments you make certainly give space for those people who you don't vote for and who you don't identify with uh, to dismiss legitimate acts of racism. So they'll take your Chrissy Teigen example, uh, or they'll take your, the example you give in the book of the dean who said that black lives matter, but also every life matters. Uh, and, and, and wasn't able to keep the deanship, they'll, they'll draw on those examples as evidence that we're wokeism, a word I hate, as you do, gone amok, and that there are no legitimate instances of racism. There are no, there are no legitimate ways that institutions and, and faculty members and police and politicians are actually undermining the capacity for black people to prosper in this country. Sure, but the thing is, for the audience that I'm writing to, we all know that racism exists. Frankly, it's an old point. We know, we've experienced it. Now, are there some people who are gonna take my writings and misinterpret them from the right wing? Sure, but the question is, does that mean that I shouldn't write? Or, more to the point, 
Does it mean that I should only write in a way that I hem and haul so much that I never really said anything and nobody reads it? No. And the reason that I say that is because, let's face it, there are people who are to the left of me who have, for example, the more, if I may, strident anti-racist message. Their views are misinterpreted and misconstrued and utilized by the hard right where they say, oh, look at all of this ridiculousness. And yet we would never say of those people, don't write what you write because you know the alt-right is gonna misrepresent it. Well, it's the same thing here. All of us are gonna be misrepresented by people we would rather not do it to an extent. But the question is, does that mean that one, we don't write, or two, more to the point, that we hem and haw so much that we don't say anything? I'm sorry, but I can't do that. Life is short. I, I would I, I won't belabor this point, but I, I would push back a little bit and say I think the difference is if the dominant reading of a text, if the dominant interpretation of a text is one that is different than the author intends, then the author also has to be sort of self-critical and accountable about the political work to which the text is used, even if the author's intention is, is, is somewhat is somewhat different. Um, it, it's maybe my, my own kind of pushback against the kind of postmodern the, the death of the author kind of arguments, you know. But 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 I I, I do want to uh, push. Uh, get you to push a little bit on one of the one of the arguments you make, uh, which is that there's this sort of contradictory position uh, that white people are forced into where they're supposed to listen to the voices of uh, of 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 people of color, but not listen too loud, or you know, you give like ten or twelve uh, sort of examples of some of the contradictions that to me didn't really feel like contradictions. They just feel like some of the challenges of being white, or some or some of the legitimate responsibilities rather of being white in, in a white supremacist world. Could first of all, could you talk about some of those sort of contradictions that you talked about? Mm hmm. Here's the answer to what you're saying, Mark. First of all, I want, and I will get to the contradictions. The book is about what will turn black America upside down. That's my main concern. And people should know that it's not just all about me complaining about things people have said. At the end of the book, at length, I talk about here are the things that we need because there are black people who need help. And that is not playing into the right wing that has nothing to do with telling people they need to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps or pull their pants up. That's not what this book is about. I am writing because I'm concerned about you know the same things that I think you are. Mark, but about the contradictions, let's try this. I'm gonna take one of those things in the list that you said. If you know a white person who never dates anybody black, you think, well, that must be because they're a racist. But then if you know a white person and you see them dating a black person, you're allowed to say, well, we have to allow for, you're not gonna say it straight, but you have to allow for the fact that maybe they're exotifying that person, both things. Now, if you hate both of those things, what exactly is a white person supposed to do? Now, my point is not just to say, yeah, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. What I'm saying is that we're taught that we're supposed to identify possible instances of racism in everything that we see. And I'm saying that that exercise, and it becomes kind of an exercise, doesn't have anything to do with helping black people in underserved communities make their lives better. I think we're distracted by posturing over what I think of as actual activism. And, and I guess for me, that, Framing makes it seem as if black people, oh, excuse me, that framing makes it seem as if white people are forced to confront an impossible set of circumstances, which to me encourages white people to just throw their hands up and say, well, look, these people are never going to be satisfied, so I might as well, might as well just live life uh, as normal, as opposed to saying, hey, my lack of attraction to, uh, and, and, I, and I, they're making me take a break, so, but my lack of attraction, a white person, could, you could say to a white person, look, maybe if you've never been attracted to a black person, that could be rooted in some kind of uh, anti-blackness. Right. But as could be an obsession with it. And I'd say the same thing for a black person who only dates white people. Uh, let's take a break. Come back and we'll talk about it on the other side. Everybody stay with me. Welcome back to Black News Tonight. I'm continuing my discussion with John McWhorter, author of the new book, Woke Racism. Uh, John, thanks for joining me again. So I'm, I'm, I pulled up because I read your book on my Kindle, which is a really bad thing to do as a bookstore owner. Don't tell anybody. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, if, if you're... You, you wrote two, you, you wrote a bunch of points here, but I'm gonna just bring up two. One, the one that we were already talking about, right? You said, if you're white and date only white people, you're a racist. On the other hand, if you're white and date a black person, you are, if only deep down, exotifying an other. I think under those circumstances that you stipulate, that would be a contradiction. But I think, it, and this to me happens a few times in the book, you seem to be oversimplifying the argument that's coming from this third wave anti-racist movement. The argument is, is more, not if you only date white people, you're a racist, but if, because I think it's 
entirely fine to date who you want. But the question is the why, right? The question is, do, have we internalized the idea that, that, that whiteness is superior, that blackness is, is aesthetically and, and morally and culturally inferior for black or white folk? And similarly, if you're obsessed with only dating black people, uh, why? It's the why behind it. I'll give one more example, then I'll give you a chance to respond. You said when whites move away from black neighborhoods, it's white flight. And when whites move into black neighborhoods, it's gentrification, even when they pay black residents gener generously for their houses. Again, it, apples to apples, that would be a contradiction. But again, the whys matter. The argument here isn't just that white people are moving away from black neighborhoods. It's, it's, the, it's why they're moving away. It's also that the state it has incentivized people historically, white people, to move out. The tax base shifts, tax policies shift. It's, it's, it's a white supremacist impulse historically, particularly in that second wave you're talking about, uh, that makes that happen. And conversely, white people are just moving into black neighborhoods. There's an entire social infrastructure that shifts when they move in, that, that pushes black people out and, and, and doesn't always, uh, even if they're paid generously, doesn't allow them to relocate help in a healthy way. So there are a lot of social and economic circumstances that undergird these, 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 these circumstances that I think you ignore in ways that give, let white people off the hook. Okay, so Mark, here's the thing. White people and the hook. What's the point? I mean, we've been talking about white people being on the hook for about 50 years. And an awful lot of things happen where a great many white people realize that they're on the hook. And they do a bunch of things. Some of these things work, some of them don't. Affirmative action, for example, worked very well. Community Reinvestment Act of 1974 didn't work. But the main point is, why don't we work on things that actually show evidence of making lives better for black people agitating for those things, coming up with a few things that actually have hope of becoming legislation in the sclerotic Congress that we have, rather than sitting around obsessing over how racist or not certain policies might be if you analyze them from a distance. I think that we get distracted with this over-intellectualized, score-settling vision of how you deal with racism, rather than working on what we can do to help people in real life. I hear everything you're saying. These things are very real. But in the end, isn't this just a conversation that people like you and me have, and we throw our arms around and we write things? But what about people who need help? Both of us are probably related to people who need help. I think we need to get more concrete about these things. I think the challenge, though, John, is that the, the concreteness comes partly through social policy. And to shift social policy, we need the, the uh, commitment of our white allies. We need uh, a broader slice of the American public than just black people to make that happen. And so, for example, if I want to shape housing policy or shift housing policy, just to use this one example, it's much easier to do that if people believe that there's an urgent problem. But if white people are convinced that, you know, these social justice warriors, again, a term you don't use, and in fact, you, you, you critique in the book, um, that these social justice warriors will never be happy, then it makes it much easier for them to not be invested in any kind of social change. So this isn't me looking for some kind of religious-like conversion of white people on the racial front. It's about wanting to shift policy and shift public consciousness, which we can't do if we just concede the ground that this is an unsolvable, un irretractable problem. Uh, I want to give you the last word. They're making me rap. Um, I'm blaming the white man for that. Um, we got to give you the last word. <laughs> I'm just going to say that really we have to think of it this way. You see a bunch of black boys for reasons beyond their control killing each other in hundreds in big cities in the summer. To look at that and to say, racism, we're going to tell white people that they're racist. I see it as rather unfeeling. And to think about, well, to what extent does government policy make it so that white people can gentrify black neighborhoods and doesn't support the black people who are there who might have to go somewhere else? These are real things. But the idea is to come up with solutions that solve all of these things, make real lives better, and stop focusing on simply trying to find evidence of places where racism might exist. It's an academic exercise, and it leaves a lot of people just scrambling, who I think that all of us could give more concrete help. That's what I'm all about. Well, John, as always, we don't agree, but I really appreciate your insight, your thoughtfulness, your sincerity, and your consistency of argument. Um, 
for whatever else people say, I don't read you cynically. I read you as somebody who cares deeply about these issues, uh, even when we strongly, strongly, strongly disagree. Uh, and I look forward That's to talking to you again, as always, man. Good to see you. Thank you. <laughs> Fair enough.